Simone Weil, the culture heroes of our liberal bourgeois civilization, are anti-liberal and anti-bourgeois. They are writers who are repetitive, obsessive, and impolite, who impress by force, not simply by their tone of personal authority and by their intellectual ardor, but by the sense of acute personal and intellectual extremity. The bigots, the hysterics, the destroyers of the self, these are the writers who bear witness to the fearful, polite time in which we live. Mostly, it is a matter of tone. It is hardly possible to give credence to ideas uttered in the impersonal tones of sanity. There are certain eras which are too complex, too deafened by contradictory historical and intellectual experiences to hear the voice of sanity. Sanity becomes compromise, evasion, a lie. An age which consciously pursues health and yet only believes in the reality of sickness. The truths we respect are those born of affliction. We measure truth in terms of the cost to the writer and suffering, rather than by the standard of an objective truth to which a writer's words correspond. Each of our truths must have a martyr. What revolted the mature Goethe in the young Kleist, who submitted his works to the elder statesman of German letters on the knees of his heart, the morbid, the hysterical, the sense of the unhealthy, the enormous indulgence and suffering out of which Kleist's plays and tales were mined, is just what we value today. Today, Kleist gives pleasure. Most of Goethe is a classroom bore. In the same way, such writers as Kierkegaard, Nietzsche, Dostoevsky, Kafka, Baudelaire, Rimbaud, Genet, and Simone Weil have their authority with us precisely because of their air of unhealthiness. Their unhealthiness is their soundness and is what carries conviction. Perhaps there are certain ages which do not need truth as much as they need a deepening of the sense of reality, a widening of the imagination. I, for one, do not doubt that the sane view of the world is the true one. But is that what is always wanted? Truth? The need for truth is not constant, no more than is the need for repose. An idea which is a distortion may have a greater intellectual thrust than the truth. It may better serve the needs of the spirit, which vary. The truth is balance, but the opposite of truth, which is unbalance, may not be a lie. Thus, I do not mean to decry a fashion but to underscore the motive behind the contemporary taste for the extreme in art and thought. All that is necessary is that we not be hypocritical, that we recognize why we read and admire writers like Simone Weil. I cannot believe that more than a handful of the tens of thousands of readers she has won since the posthumous publication of her books and essays really share her ideas, nor is it necessary necessary to share Simone Weil's anguished and unconsummated love affair with the Catholic Church, or accept her Gnostic theology of divine absence, or espouse her ideals of body denial, or concur in her violently unfair hatred of Roman civilization and the Jews. Similarly, with Kierkegaard and Nietzsche, most of their modern admirers could not and do not embrace their ideas. We read writers of such scathing originality for their personal authority, for the example of their seriousness, for their manifest willingness to sacrifice themselves for their truths, and only piecemeal, for their views. As the corrupt Alcibiades followed Socrates, unable and unwilling to change his own life, but moved, enriched, and full of love, so the sensitive modern reader pays his respect to a level of spiritual reality which is not, could not, be his own. Some lives are exemplary, others not, and of exemplary lives there are those which invite us to imitate them, and those which we regard from a distance with a mixture of revulsion, pity, and reverence. It is roughly the difference between the hero and the saint, if one may use the latter term in an aesthetic rather than a religious sense. Such a life, absurd in its exaggerations and degree of self-mutilation, like Kleist's, like Kierkegaard's, was Simone Weil's. I am thinking of the fanatical asceticism of Simone Weil's life, her contempt for pleasure and for happiness, her noble and ridiculous political gestures, her elaborate self-denials, her tireless courting of affliction, and I do not exclude her homeliness, her physical clumsiness, her migraines, her tuberculosis. No one who loves life would wish to imitate her dedication to martyrdom, or would wish it for his children or for anyone else whom he loves. 
Yet so far as we love seriousness, as well as life, we are moved by it, nourished by it. In the respect we pay to such lives, we acknowledge the presence of mystery in the world. And mystery is just what the secure possession of the truth, an objective truth, denies. In this sense, all truth is superficial. In some, but not all, distortions of the truth, some, but not all, insanity, some, but not all, unhealthiness, some, but not all, denials of life are truth-giving sanity-producing, health-creating, and life-enhancing.